Welcome to Crowd. This week we're joined by Hilary Large, who is the Director of Chanbot Marketing and former Interim CMO of Forever Unique. Hilary, welcome to Crowd. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Obviously in Crowd, what we like to do is talk about how you build your crowd or audience. Um, you've had lots of experience. Do you want to give us a little bit of background about Chanbot Marketing and the work you've been doing for Forever as well? Will do. So, um, I... I've done quite a lot in my career around senior level marketing roles and at a point where my daughter, my youngest daughter got to be in the age of two, I had a bit of an epiphany which was that I just wasn't spending enough time at home with the girls and I just wasn't able to be mum. So I thought I'm going to set up my own consultancy business which is called Chandot Um, and it's a consultancy business in the sense that I go in and I consult, but I become the de facto either marketing director or head of marketing for the businesses I go into. Um, consultancy is a bit of a weird word because it's quite, I think it can be a bit, it's a bit laden sometimes. People think consultants, you know, they come in, they take your own watch and tell you the time. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm really not like that. I, I'm very much committed to getting my hands dirty and, and being the de facto you know, leader of the team. Yeah, I suppose you're kind of an interim CMO, exactly. aren't you? I, it's interim CMO, interim head of, or quite often it's just a need. So Forever Unique, they had an existing head of e-com, but she was a very talented lady, but very specific e-com uh, skills. And they had decided at the time that they wanted to become a fully direct-to-consumer brand and sort of get rid of a lot of their B2B stuff because they'd sold B2B through many uh, retail outlets, but they wanted to focus on direct-to-consumer. She wasn't a specialist in D2C, and, and I am, So and she wanted a break, so she exited, um, and I took over as, as CMO there, very much with a view to readying the business and getting the, the direct-to-consumer piece um, ready to go. It's really interesting. Um, I think one of the main things that we've looked at when we talk to people um, on this particular show is about company culture. And obviously, if you're kind of parachuting into business, you're there short term, you've probably seen lots of different cultures across different businesses. What, what kind of effect do you think that has on building an audience or building a crowd? So you're dead right. I have I have seen pretty much every single type of company culture, and I've worked in really small businesses where turnover is you know three, four, five million. I've worked in huge corporates where turnover is well over a billion. So Shop Direct, well, I think they're now the very group. They would be an example where I really found the company culture there quite difficult, and I think that was um, I think that was replicated in the external. Uh, voice of the company and I think you find that people often try and disassociate internal culture from external comms and I think it doesn't matter how um, how clever you are at your external comms if your internal culture and your internal brand is faulty and fundamentally flawed those external comms are never going to be right yeah. and and shop direct at the time so I'm talking between sort of 2003 and 2010 was a bit of a sterling example of that, where it was very autocratic, very male. Um, The entire board was made up of blokes. Um, I think there might have been a female HR director, but she didn't last long. And I think that was interesting. Um, It felt like a very layered hierarchical culture um, and everything was kind of, well, you sign this off and hand it up to the next person and they sign it off. And it was so hard to get decisions made. And I think that that, that gave a very... Um, We tried to be fleet of foot. So, for example, when we developed the very brand, um, we tried to be fleet of foot and create something very new. And actually, the team who really worked on the the kernel of that brand were committed to something very innovatory and very different and finding a different audience, a different crowd, younger than Little Woods, less cash strapped than Little Woods, less needing of credit than Little Woods. and, and that was a great idea. And the, the fundamental sort of innovative quality of the brand was great. But by the time it had passed through all the layers of bureaucracy that there were in Shop Direct, um, it actually just became a very watered down version. And I think it's, I look back on it now, and it was 2010 when the brand, no, 2009 when that brand launched. And cla- it launched with a massive catalogue you know, in a classic shop direct way. What do we do to create an audience? I know, let's put a massive book on their doorstep. You know, the <laughs> size of sort of thing that you can prop up your fridge with, you know, a great doorstep. That, well, actually that was never the, um, that was never the, the beginning imaginings of Very. It was never gonna be another catalog brand. It was never gonna be the 
paper-based model, but because it passed through all of that bureaucracy, those layers, and by the time it got to the board, suddenly it was a very different beast. And, and interestingly, the crowd that we found initially was not the crowd we intended because all that happened was we migrated the slightly younger Littlewoods customer onto Very. And that was not the intention. The intention was to create a totally different audience, much younger, much more fashion-led. And over time, that's definitely happened. And Very is a hugely strong brand now, much stronger than Littlewoods. Um, so the two have swapped. It's, it's the, you know, that is the, the mainstay of that business. Um, but it took time. And that was, I think, it could have been so much quicker to hit its stride and so much quicker to find that crowd had there not been these really saggy layers of really autocratic culture. And ultimately, that's why I left, because I found it so hard I'm quite a creative person. I found it so hard to get anything done. And what, what else have you seen that is a bit more flexible and a bit more fleet of foot, like you say? So I think a good example would be Forever Unique. So Sandeep and Seema, great people. Um, they gave me the um, opportunity to crack on. And I think Sandeep is not a fan of managing people. And I tell no tales after school. It's not his thing. He is a very, he just wants to run the business and, and, and make money. But he's very good at saying, okay, but you do that. I want you to develop a culture for the people here. I want you to create a bit of a, a culture of, of, of solidarity and a camaraderie and innovation and fun. Um, and, and actually, I, I, I hereby devolve that to you. You're going to run the commercial team. They're, they're all yours, Hillary, and there are 17 of them. You just do that. If you want to create KPIs for people and do objectives and, and all that kind of stuff, you do it. Um, and that was great because it it was my culture to create really mm. um, and that was really that was much better but I think that can only happen in a small business you can't he couldn't have done that if he'd been Mark Newton Jones running shop direct as he was back in the day yeah how do you think that that internal culture then translates into where the, the companies talk to the crowd and the kind of like tone of voice that they have so again I think well a, a good example would be I did quite a bit of work for hotter shoes and They've again changed dramatically, um, and I think you know a lot of credit to Vicky Betts, who's there at the moment as chief commercial officer. She brings with her a lot of innovation and technical skill. But when I was there, uh, Hotter Shoes was a very traditional family-owned company. It hadn't had those external capital injections, and it was a very again quite a layered company, quite a gentle culture. But I think that there was always a frustration from the teams who worked on the marketing comms that there were certain things we weren't allowed to say, certain areas we weren't allowed to voice to the crowd. And again, it stopped us finding our crowd. So we were brilliant at Hotter at selling comfortable shoes to old ladies. <laughs> couldn't, we couldn't have been better at that. We were A1 at that, world class. But what we wanted to do was pivot that, that message as much as anything to say, actually, yes, we can sell comfy shoes to old ladies, but actually we've got some real modern uh, footwear here that's extremely comfortable but doesn't look like the old lady footwear. It looks like modern, looks like Birkenstocks or it looks like Skechers. It's much more contemporary. Um, but actually, because it was still a family owned business and the guy who'd set up the, well, the guy whose background was living that business, um, he didn't really want to move in that way. He wanted, he was committed to selling old lady shoes to old ladies. And so whenever we would bring up those conversations around, well, can we not find a crowd that's a bit different? Those, those were kind of always pulled back in again and it, it stopped you. So I think it, it meant that our, our external comms were always a bit fuddy-duddy and a bit traditional and a bit dull and a bit gray. And actually that's fine, it meets an audience demand, but it didn't allow us to shift to a different audience that we needed to shift to because that was the growing audience. Um, and I think actually they've made a much better fist of it latterly with Vicky there uh, and it looks m a much more modern and fresh brand now but I think that internal culture so informs what you can and can't say to an external customer and I think if you try and make an internal culture so very different from what you're trying to push out externally the customer can smell a rat yeah. they're not stupid you know um, customers know when something doesn't quite work you know, you hear a lot of companies espouse, well, this is our culture. Mm. And actually, you know, it's not the case. You know, and, and a, a classic example being, there are so many, and I'm not going to criticise them, this is an observation, so many fast fashion brands who espouse, you know, girl power, female empowerment, body positivity, yet you know that actually internally, they're not brilliant at treating their staff 
all that well. And sometimes the women and men who work there, but predominantly it's female workforce, don't have that great a time. I think you can smell a rat. Mm. You mentioned earlier that some of the businesses that you work with have entirely male boards. And I think something that we've seen, even in like some of the larger companies, when there's female representation on a board, that they tend to be the companies that do well. And the ones on the top sort of 10 companies on the FTSE tend to have reasonable representation of, of all kinds of different levels of diversity, whether it's class, gender, whatever that might be. Is that something that you've, you've, you've definitely seen through your career when you've been in different places and different cultures that the ones that have that diversity, do they tend to be the ones that have that more instinctive culture? I think so, and, and it, it genuinely confounds me because I'm somebody who can read a P&L really well and I love to do that. And I can see, you could, well, anyone can see, as you said, the better performing, that upper quartile performance of you know, the, the top, the, the FTSE businesses, they have a more diverse board. I just don't understand why more businesses don't go, mm, okay, well, let's try and replicate that a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And certainly some businesses try, um, but I think a lot of it's lip service because I think it's still um, often a male CEO. And there's a, great, there's a great quote, and it's something like, there are more CEOs called John of FTSE 250 companies than there are women. Wow. I mean, that's as stark as it is. And then if you take it a layer down, you know, into black women or indeed black people full stop, um, I don't understand why people don't want diversity because it, it proves its power in the P&L. And, and I'm, you know, and I've been on, I have been on some fantastic boards and I've been on some appalling boards that have been adversarial and very male dominated. Um, and equally, I've been on some, but not, not all male boards like that. I've been on some male boards that are, that are quite gentle. So when I was at Pavers Footwear, again, old lady shoes, um, and that was a real tra digital transformation piece, that board is very male, but it's quite a gentle male culture because it's a very family owned business, it's still all wholly family owned, very profitable, great business. Um, the only thing that I found there was that there was a real fear that it wasn't even about gender, it was about non-family. So if you're on this board, but you're not, your surname isn't Pavers, you know, then actually you're a bit of an outsider. So we're not going to be able to listen to your innovative ideas because actually we want to only really hear stuff from within the family about innovation. That's really where we want it to stay. And that was quite stifling. Um, a great, a, I still say, amazing business. I mean, they're just an unknown business. People think Paver's Shoes, what's that? They've got like over 200 stores. It's just that they're in really odd locations like Market Drayton and stuff. They're, they're in really small market towns, hugely profitable. But in terms of a company who know their audience so well, and interestingly, a culture that really fits their audience. So they really are, whereas Hotter wanted to transition to selling more modern footwear to a more modern woman, actually pavers are thoroughly happy selling old fashioned footwear to old ladies and into people who are in residential care homes. And they know their audience so well, they know their crowd, they know their crowd is definitely hanging around in little market towns, seaside towns, garden centres, and the family know that, the family grew the business to do that. And it's just because it's not sexy and not glamorous that nobody's ever heard of them. It doesn't mean it's not profitable. It doesn't it? mean no. that they don't have a hell of a P&L at the end of the day, that there isn't a, you know, it's an extraordinarily robust business. Um, and, and I have to say the people who, from the family who work in it, are extraordinarily clever and adept people. Um, they've grown a family culture um, and it can be a little bit uninviting if you are not, you know, if you don't have the surname Pavers. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's a great business and they, boy, do they know their crowd. You yeah, know? I think... They're a really good example of a business that keeps the customer base incredibly loyal, aren't they? And I think loyalty is another thing that's come up a lot when we've been when we've done the crowd shows. That I know acquisition is a big thing when you're growing a business, but there's little point doing lots of acquisition if you're just losing them after one one sale. And I think that the statistics something like if you get to a second sale, then you've got a 54% chance of, of having a lifetime customer. But if you've just got that one sale, then you constantly pay money. And I think with the cookie legislation, it's going to change in the coming months. Yeah, next few months, isn't it? Yeah, there's obviously going to be a much bigger um, need to do loyalty schemes and look at retention. Because you're not going to be able to go and literally yeah. acquire, 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 because you won't be allowed. It, and it'll be the cost of bits that you can do are going to be with the likes of Facebook and Instagram. And, and the cost will go... And the cost will go straight up. Ooh. So I think like having like an internal database, using things like email is going to be a really cheap, easy way of keeping in touch and communicating with customers and knowing exactly 
first party and permissioned who your clients yeah, are that you communicate and getting with. all that stuff straight and I think people again people see the Facebook and Instagram oh, it's really sexy advertising actually the best form of advertising is to your own people yeah. with your through your own medium be that the email channel be that through your own website that's the best way to create great stickiness you know direct mail a great medium for talking to your customers and again it's a it's a sort of a, a more old fashioned medium but it's a great way of talking to your customers and really cementing that relationship with with your crowd yeah, and to be fair the only thing you tend to get through the post is bills so it's quite nice if you get something well, else isn't it it is and I, it's so interesting because everybody i think again if you're if you're outside the world that we're in people think oh direct mail catalogs that's just for old people actually there are so many young businesses now who are reinvesting in direct mail and doing a paper-based vehicle even though it costs quite a bit of money because postage is expensive and papers you know that that price is only going north but actually, it's one of the stickiest mediums for retaining your crowd. If you can get a physical format of your brand into his or her home, you know, and I think about my husband, as we were talking earlier, is obsessed with running and training. And he gets this catalogue, runners something or other, I don't know. I couldn't be less interested in it. Comes once a month and he will buy something without fail. And the only thing that instigates that purchase is the paper on the doormat because he's not a surfer of the internet. He's not someone who will ever get follow retargeting or anything. He'll only look at that paper catalogue and he'll, you know, have a brew. It's quite interesting. I mean, we've both been going to networking events and conferences all about sort of digital transformation, digital media, and it is a, a huge thing. But I think people have been saying that email's dead and direct mail's dead for as long as I've been involved in digital marketing, like it, it's just been a constant thing, but it seems to be coming back and it's probably going to come back even more. Post, if, yeah, in post the next the, few months, post post all the cookie changes. stuff. I think it, yeah. it will do because it'll be, it's it's permission based and it's your own database. And you can, you can talking about creating that culture and that sort of ability to convey your brand. I think you can do that so well in a really beautiful email. I'm thinking, I mean, I um, follow a brand, it's a jewellery brand called Astrid and Miu. They're great on social, and I would say they probably are a social first brand, but their emails are stunning, really beautiful pieces of communication that I look forward to reading. And they have a podcast as well that I look forward to listening to. Um, and they're considering doing some direct mail because actually direct mail for jewellery is great because you can photograph it really well. Um, and actually the page densities, you can get quite a lot of jewellery on one page so that you can make it quite a profitable, you know, entity um, and that's a brand that really targets a 25 to 35 year old customer um, and who'd have thought they'd be considering a catalog but actually they want that complete 360 full multi -channel yeah. Place, yeah. And, and their emails are beautiful and I look forward to receiving their emails and they've managed their base so well I don't get one every day I get any they, they know that I'm not a, a constant clicker so I get one I think twice a week um, and that's they've clearly worked out that's my level of interest um, great yeah, I mean, if you properly use things like segmentation and you're actually sending things out at the right kind of frequency and there's some real decent content going out, it's great. There are brands that will just blast everybody with offers, which I don't necessarily think is the, the best way to well, do things. Well, I just things. hit delete. If I, yeah. if I, you know, that's the thing with the, the example of Astrid and MeU. They send out, you know, they'll talk about women who inspire us, you know. And the entire email won't be in selling mode at all. It's a narrative and it's a, and it actually, if you clicked on some of the links, a couple of them take you back to Astrid and Miu, but a couple of them take you to more information about that person mm -hmm. and how she has, you know, had a very difficult life and she's, you know, and she's actually a dress designer. And so you can go and buy her dresses. And the, the lady, Connie, who runs that business is very open about actually, you know, this business, yes, it's a, it's a it's, of course it's a commercial entity, but we want to support other embryonic businesses through what we do. So she's chosen sort of five partner businesses who are teeny tiny businesses that she wants to support. And, and they so know their crowd because clearly their customers love it. Yeah, and it sounds like that's the kind of business and doing it that way really keeps people engaged. So like you say, you've, you've clicked through one thing, you've gone to something that's given you a bit more background than an individual and they, it seems like people are getting like really well engaged with that kind of brand. Is that what what kinds of strategies have you used in in roles that you've been in to keep people engaged? Is it really down to that level of content? It massively depends on the business. So at Forever Unique, it's a brand that I'm sure you you know, and I'm sure viewers and what listeners might know is um, the Real Housewives of Cheshire is very much part of that brand because Seema, who is Sandeep's husband, is one of the the, the Cheshire Housewives, and she's one of the most well thought of Cheshire Housewives because she doesn't get involved in the scrappiness. So one of the things we did at Forever Unique was made sure that loads of our comms were aligned 
as far as we could be within ITV guidelines <laughs> to that, that asset. So we had to be really careful. We couldn't send out an email or a piece of communication or a Facebook you know, post that said, you know, buy Real Housewife of Cheshire style. And we wouldn't anyway, because that would have been a bit too blatant. But we had to spin that to, because we know our audience was after that look. We know that if we put a jumper on Seema in a, you know, a beautiful hail restaurant, it will sell really well. Even better if she's sitting opposite another one of the housewives. So we created and curated a lot of that content well ahead of time to kind of be able to, all the way through the series, there's two series a year, not just have assets throughout the series, but after the series to have stuff that we could constantly talk about that was related to housewives because it was very commercial. And we knew our audience in that sense. They were the glamorous women of Cheshire who want to look like Seema and the rest of the housewives and who probably have had a nip and tuck, probably, um, you know, expect that they want, you know, they want to look like those women and they want to wear those clothes. Um, and so I think that strategy for us, and whenever we did posts on Insta, we, we got the other women to come on to our Insta to take, you know, do takeovers. So we'd have Rachel Lugo taking over, or we'd have Dawn Ward taking over so that the, our customers could see a bit more behind the scenes. You know, we had to be really careful because ITV don't like that really, because it's their asset and they don't want you commercially exploiting what they consider to be their asset. So we've got to be careful. Um, but it works really, really well. And if you think about, just thinking back again to a, a much bigger business, back to Shop Direct Days and running the Littlewoods brand there, those comms were all about making sure that you were reassuring. So though the mum figure in the house that is a working class house that may struggle for money, the mum, the matriarch is everything. She's the, you know, you know, certainly, you know, single parent households where it's the mother figure who leads. She sorts the finances, she buys the uniform, she buys the big telly, but most of the time she can't afford to buy it outright. She needs some credit and finance to be able to do that. And the Littlewoods proposition spoke to her and still does, you know, and allows her to purchase big goods over a period of time. And there's a bit of, you know, there's a bit of negativity in the press about that, but because there are, you know, interest rates and that kind of thing involved. Um, but actually, Littlewoods was an interest free proposition. It's just that we embedded the cost of the credit into the cost of the goods. Um, there, you know, you can you can spin that any way, but nonetheless, we knew our audience really well, and all the comms that went to her would talk to her less about the items, more about managing her finances. So actually, she would be really happy to have a section of the catalogue not just devoted to selling product, but also talking about managing bills. How's the best way to pay off your, you know, when you get your statement through? How, you know, where do I go to pay it? What do I do? How how often do you want me to pay? All of those things were hardwired into our comms because that was our audience. What would you say to somebody that's maybe starting a business now um, or somebody that might be watching that's just entering their career into, into marketing or e-com, what would you say is the, the real fundamental thing that you've seen that's, that you've had real success with over the years to really build a crowd? Well, I think there's, well, the one thing I would say, and I think this is a real, this isn't something I've necessarily had success with, but the, but the more I watch of what's going around me now, I think it's really important. If you're starting off and you're either an entrepreneur creating your own business or you're starting off in your career with a with another business, I think, think about your personal brand. And I never thought about that years and years ago. I've never ever, I've only really thought about it in the past couple of years because I've really started to do more of this kind of thing. But actually think about who you want to be and think about how, think about who your audience is in terms of the people who work alongside you, the people who are employing you, the people who are receiving the content and the work that you're doing think about that because actually that will follow you around and you'll you know you'll become known for either doing good work or perhaps not doing so so good work and i think it's important that you create a good reputation for yourself and a reputation for treating people really well and it's something that i believe hugely in you know i've been in cultures that have been quite adversarial and i pride myself on not being like that i'm very full on and people will always say god you know Hillary, whoo, um, and I am, I'm really in your face. I'm a big character and I don't shy away from that. And that probably is my personal brand, but I've always taken pride in treating people really, really well and, and knowing my audience personally. So I think that's number one, I would say, know, as, a, as an individual, know your audience. And the second thing I would say is there are so many more tools now to know your audience than there ever were. So if you're going into a business and you're working on the e-com team and you have some exposure to the social team, they have so many rich insights. You as a, maybe you're an email marketeer, you've got rich insights. They're things that people of my age never had. We couldn't ever really crunch our data in that way. But you know, you now can go on Instagram and do a poll. 
like that. You know, you don't have to think, oh, we'll do, we'll do some market research. You know, <laughs> we'll go and art, you know, we'll, we'll design a, a questionnaire of four pages, you know, and we'll get it. We don't, none of that exists anymore. You can stick a poll on Insta straight away, you know. Instant feedback. Brilliant. And use that because I wish I, you know, particularly if you're launching new products or new services and you just want to say A or B, what a great way to do it, yeah. you know, and even do it on your, I do it sometimes on my own personal Insta, you know, because um, I've got a, a small, very small clothing business that I've just started with a, with a friend and we're just looking at different designs and things. Well, A and B, you know, literally my audience can say, well, I prefer that print to that print. Well, great. That helps me. You know, um, I still ultimately make the decision, but I've got a very quick feedback loop in front of me. And, you know, it's great to have that because, you know, 10 years ago, we, you didn't have that. Yeah, there's, there's data everywhere now. It's, it's it, brilliant. And there's yeah, too much. Right. There's, there's too much there's as too well. There's too much to handle sometimes. You, you kind of need systems in place to like whistle down what's important. You but, do. But there is so much there's available so to much. use it right. And, and you can just quickly, there's, there's deep data where you've got to really dive into it and crunch the numbers. And I'll be honest, I prefer other people to do that for me than do it myself. Or just get an AI system. Yeah, it's or some, <laughs> something cleverer than me. Something can, can crunch it better than me. Um, but if it's quick stuff, you know, so it's so brilliant that you can just literally go on Instagram or go on Facebook, stick up a quick poll, you know, do a live. And I think you don't be afraid of doing any of that kind of thing that, you know, I probably have been too nervous about doing that kind of thing. And actually now I'm a bit longer in the tooth. I think, do you know what? Why not? Why not? Do, you know, I don't, if people don't like it, they don't have to look. You know, if, they, if people don't want, don't like you putting a poll on, well, don't vote. You can quite quickly see who's really engaged as well, can't you? With the, there's going to be who is my audience? There will exactly. be regular sort of VIP customers that are involved and really super exactly. engaged. Exactly. And of with thing. this little brand that we're developing, this little clothing brand that I'm doing, this so my personal business because I've always said, oh, I've always done fashion for other people, and I'm now thinking I might just have a crack at it myself. Um, it's great because I already know who my loyalists are. I already know who those VIPs are. And if I need to, I can instant message them. Yeah. You know? I know exactly <laughs> their, their names. I virtually know where they live. Um, you know, and, and that's great because I can see and immediately I can get feedback on shape, size, colorway, patterns, you know, price. You know, I, we, we did some, um, we, we've started the business on social. It's a, it's a social first business and we're using Facebook and Instagram to sell and we will have a website in time. But it's great because we can do our lives and we can, on the lives, I can see the stream literally as we stream, who's interested, who wants to buy stuff, what sizes they are. Great. Yeah, instant feedback. Yeah. Perfect. Um, are there any businesses that excite you at the moment? Um, yeah, and there's some businesses that are what I call the weird and wacky that really excite me. And they are in the apparel world because I'm fascinated by that. So, mm -hmm. classic example being l replacement leather. So, all of the massive design houses, so you're talking your Hermes, your Dior, your Chanel, the way they make their money, as we all know, is not through the cl clothes, it's through the handbags and through the fragrance. And unfortunately, whatever you've used, they get a lot of abuse for using leather. And leather is also very, very hard on the environment. The tanning of it, the production of leather is really tough on the environment. So we've got to find a better way of producing sustainable leather-like product. And until now, it's been a bit crap. So I can, if somebody brought two handbags in here, you know, quickly I can look. And even if they're a really good PU, I can say, no, that's not leather, that is. But these, and it's bizarre, isn't it? mushroom protein is now being grown and the investment in mushroom protein is phenomenal because you can produce a result that even you know, the chief handbag sniffer at Hermes couldn't tell the difference between a real Hermes leather bag and one that's made out of this, it's called mycoprotein. Now, I find that fascinating because it's good to grow fungus, actually. It does the environment, the impact that that has on biodiversity is great. So let's grow as many mushrooms as we can. Um, so it's fantastic from an environmental point of view. It doesn't do any damage and it produces a beautiful result that people cannot tell the difference between. I find all that kind of stuff. And I believe, you know, Elon Musk was fighting to try and get shares in and I think it's fascinating, you know, that those sorts of businesses that 10 years ago or even five years ago, somebody would have said, you, you're having a laugh, aren't you? Mushroom protein to make a handbag. Are you, you, you know, have you been on the mushrooms yourself, Hill? <laughs> you know, but actually that's a really, I find that, and I, th I could see that being huge. Stella McCartney's now very invested in, um, in all of that stuff. Obviously she runs a vegan brand. Um, but she's now, you know, talking about all different ways of producing the, so cashmere, for example, cashmere is actually really hard on the earth as well. Cashmere production is hard on, hard on them poor wee goats, um, but it's really hard on you know, the goat herders. It does, it's very um, hungry in terms of resource and the amount of um, roaming space the, the, the goats need. 
But actually, if you, there is so much cashmere that comes into reuse. If you could reuse that cashmere, and typically with reuse of cashmere, it's shorter fibres, but you can make a really exciting product. Um, it looks a little bit different, but it's still cashmere, and its impact is, is nil because it hasn't had to have all that. It, it's recycled cashmere, in effect. And I think that's so fascinating. You can see all the recycled polyesters now. So I'm, I'm fascinated in all of that kind of stuff. And I think there is, to talk about crowd, there's a huge and growing audience yeah, for that sort I think of stuff. Like people are just becoming more and more socially conscious, like year on year, aren't they? And there's an interview with the head of supply chain at, at uh, Unilever who said that 70% of their growth was from brands with purpose. Yeah. And it, and it is, there's, there's money in it, isn't there? If you, if you, there is money you, in them, their yeah, hills. Yeah, I tell you, there is, there, and I think anybody who's starting a brand now, can't, you can't start a brand without thinking about that. So this little tiny embryonic uh, clothing brand that I'm working with my friend on, we have two sort of arms, to, two strings to our bow. We New product, but also selling pre-loved, but really good quality pre-loved product um, and sourcing it in a way that we know how to. And I think that's really interesting because that's what people want is a bit, we can't do entirely pre-loved because it's not scalable in the way that we'd like it to be, but we want to marry a little bit of both. And I think if you're starting a business, you have to look at, well, what's, what, what am I doing in the planet and what can, I, what can I give back a little bit? So if I'm doing some bad and I have to acknowledge that the, production, the mass production of clothing isn't great for the earth, what can I do on the side that might be a little bit better, that might weave a little bit of goodness back into my brand, that gives me some purpose, gives me something to talk about as well and to, to talk, you know, to have a real voice to my customers to say, you know, well, we have, you know, we're 60% new, 40% pre-loved. Well, actually, that's a great, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah, it is. Has, has the business launched? We're launched, we're live. It's very, very small. It's very small. And where can people find you? They can find us at Kit and Caboodle on Facebook and Kit and Caboodle on Insta. Um, it's very much, we know our customer. She's very much an over, probably an over 35 lady. Um, she's definitely uh, aspiring to be a mum or is a mum currently. And she wants really great product that she won't find elsewhere. Brilliant. Hilary, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Very, very interesting conversation. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back with another episode of Crowd really soon.